Testing and contact tracing are among the most important public health measures in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Ontario is asking residents to get its contact tracing app loaded onto their smartphones. Joining us now on how technology like this works and where caution could be warranted, David Lee, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto. And he joins us from the provincial capital tonight. Welcome, David. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to speak to you because I don't really know very much about the app. Uh, what I do know is that Ontario is the first province to use this app. How does the COVID alert work? Um, so the app uses your smartphone and the smartphone um, has um, a, a device called Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is, you can think of it as kind of like, um, like your remote control for a TV. So two phones with Bluetooth can talk to each other um, using that Bluetooth protocol. Um, so what happens is if your phone comes in close contact, so that it's within the Bluetooth range of another phone, the two phones will do a, a digital handshake. Um, and so as you go about your day, um, you will have handshakes with various phones. And then if you or one of the people that you've come with uh, contact with become infected, um, they have the option of notifying with the app that they have become infected. And now a server will then broadcast to all the other phones um, the uh, identity of that phone. And then the um, other phones can then notify their users to say that they may have come in contact with someone who's, uh, who's been infected. Um, now, one of the unique things about this app is that it protects privacy. So the um, identity or name of your phone when it's doing that Bluetooth broadcast changes every 15 minutes. So you never use the same name twice. And so that kind of gives you a whole bunch of fake names or pseudonyms. And so it's very difficult to trace that um, exposure back to a particular person. All you know is that you've come in contact with someone who has uh, tested positive. Uh, we're going to talk more about privacy in a few moments, um, but I want to get an idea of how the app works. How close do you have to be to someone and for how long for it to be considered uh, an exposure? Um, so those, those details are not published. Uh, we know that the range of Bluetooth can be um, a couple hundred feet at best. But Bluetooth, just like your remote control, um, it's sensitive to things like if there's a wall in between or if, there, if there's interference, even um, even if there's um, like a, a table or some furniture nearby, that can cause reflections and reduce the range. So there isn't one set range, um, but it can be anywhere between a couple feet to even a couple hundred feet under um, ideal circumstances. Um, how long you have to be uh, in contact with, that's also something that um, the health authority can set. So um, uh, the public health authority can set that as part of the one of the settings in the app. Um, now, once you have the app on the phone, and if you think that you've been exposed, what's the responsibility of the app user? Um, so the app user has the option of notifying um, people that they have been exposed. And the way they do that is when you test positive, you're going to be given a code, and you enter that code into the app, um, and then the app does everything else. If you don't enter the code, then you don't notify anybody. So the, the notification is completely voluntary, and that's just the way the app is designed. If this is voluntary, um, how effective is the app then? Well, that's one of the interesting things is we, we don't know a lot of things. This is the first time, I guess, in human history we've, we've been in a pandemic and at the same time had this technology available to us. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that we just don't know because it's the first time. Another big question that people ask is how many... Uh, what percentage of the population has to be using the app for it to be effective? Effective, because um, if you come in contact with another phone that's not using the app, then that phone is essentially invisible to, to your phone, even if you are using it. So only other phones that are using the app mm -hmm. um, are going to be able to do this notification. Other countries have tried uh, something similar. How has it worked in other countries? Um, there's been mixed results. Um, uh, so one of the first countries to do it was uh, Singapore. Um, so they, they had their app out um, basically in late March, as, as soon as uh, you know, we, be, we were becoming aware that there was a pandemic coming. And so they've been, they, they probably have the most data in history of it. And their indications are mixed. So um, they only had about 20 to 30 percent of the population install it. Uh, so they haven't had a lot of notifications, mm -hmm. but there were cases where people were living very close together. In particular, they had an outbreak among migrant workers. And in, their, in that situation, it did prove to be helpful. It, it allowed them to, to, f to notify people a lot sooner. In Canada, Alberta had its own app. And a few days ago, they decided that they're not using that one. They're going to use COVID alert. Why did they make mm -hmm. that decision? 
Well, so that we got to dig a bit deeper. So um, to build these types of apps, um, originally, uh, the, when you have this Bluetooth tracing, it can also be a tool for surveillance, just state surveillance. And so when Google and Apple designed their smartphones, they made it so that it was difficult to use their smartphones for surveillance. Um, now, when COVID happened, there were a lot of calls to, to open up that a bit so that we could use it for exposure notification or contact tracing. So Apple and Google designed the infrastructure so that it would protect personal privacy while allowing it to do this kind of anonymous exposure notification. Now, one of the stipulations is that they only wanted one app per country to be using that infrastructure. So as a result, you cannot have both Alberta and the national COVID alert app using the same infrastructure. And, and I'm guessing too, um, in order for it to be effective, a certain percentage of Canadians have to use it. What would you say is that percentage? Well, um, I really wouldn't know better than anybody else because we don't have any data on that. Um, people have run simulations and the simulations say um, anywhere between 50 to 70 percent uh, are would be required to use it for it to be effective. And I would say it's not like it's an you know on off effective not effective scale. Um, it's it's really a, a scale where as more people use it, um, it becomes more effective. So even even if it's 30 percent, it probably might still have some effect. But uh, I guess you really start to see the gains um, when it's above 50% to 70% or so. Do we know how many people have downloaded it yet? Um, I just checked uh, a couple of days ago, and I think it was about 500,000 downloads. But um, it also tracks uh, installs, so you can download it but not, not use it. And I think it's somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 right now. Do you, get a sense, do you get the sense that there's a bit of a trepidation to use this app by Canadians, from Canadians? Yes, yes, I do. I, you know, just from conversations with people and questions I get, I think people are unsure about what kind of information is being shared, how, how it protects their privacy, and quite frankly, whether it works and it's worth the trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my opinion is I, th I think the government has selected a, um, an approach that leans towards privacy um, and uh, does its best in that regard, but still confers some benefit. How much benefit, we don't know. Um, so, so I've personally installed the app, and I'm going to keep it installed. Um, do you think that we lose the effectiveness or the functionality when we're looking to maintain privacy rights over making sure that everybody is safe? Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. We, we definitely do lose something. So for example, in this particular uh, design that um, we're using a COVID alert that, that really came from Google and Apple, um, you do not collect information about where you were exposed or what time you were exposed. It's really just a hint to say you might have been exposed and you should go get tested and then you can do kind of traditional manual contact tracing to find out um, who else you might have been infected and where you were infected. Now, um, you could have apps that collect more data, that collect information about when you were exposed and where you were exposed. And that information can be useful to health authorities and, and to the government. For example, um, if they knew that certain activities more, were more risky and others that are perceived as risky aren't as risky, that could certainly help with things like reopening the economy, uh, making, uh, allowing activities uh, to continue while at the same time maintaining safety. But unfortunately, this app, uh, because it protects privacy, it, it, there's no way to protect privacy and get that kind of data. So, so that's a trade-off there. Um, is there any situation, because Google and Apple have, their, have complicated histories, um, is there a case where um, an employer could be compelled to get information from Google and Apple uh, about uh, an employee through the app? So the design of the app doesn't really allow you to get that kind of information. Um, so um, uh, the, 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 the server only maintains information temporarily. And uh, the, 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 the claim is that the server will delete data every two weeks. So um, within that two week window, you may be able to get some information. Even then, there are other safeguards that would make it difficult. So it appears that it would be hard to do something like that, yeah. Uh, early reports found that this app doesn't work on older smartphones. Do you think this technology is accessible enough for all Canadians? 
Yes. Well, so so it doesn't work on smartphones older than five years, and that's just because of limitations. So Bluetooth has gone through several versions, and the older versions of Bluetooth don't have the scanning kind of capability that I was talking about earlier. So um, as a result, uh, yeah, I think there are going to be certainly marginalized groups that uh, either do not have smartphones or do not have access to a newer smartphone, and um, they would not be able to use the app. So. Um, I just wanted to read something um, from uh, the Ottawa Citizen that was uh, published yesterday, actually. Um, and uh, Daniela Barreto writes, while the voluntary COVID alert is not enforced by the government, we must ensure new technologies are not enforced by employers or used as a means of discrimination, surveillance, or coercion to return to work in potentially unsafe environments. Rhetoric like, don't worry, we have the app, fails to recognize the systemic barriers behind people not using it and places trust and responsibility in unproven technologies. What would you say to people who fear using um, a government-sponsored app? Well, I think that fear is warranted. Um, I, should, I would say that we live in a country, fortunately, with laws that have some checks and balances that, um, uh, uh, you know, in theory should prevent abuse of the data. And um, ultimately, we, we, we have to trust our system and, 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 and believe that it's going to work for the benefit of Canadians. Um, um, and I certainly do. I'm thinking, too, um, on, on the subject of, of privacy and keeping the information anonymous. If you do live in, say, a small town and an alert goes out, it might be easier for people to determine who the person is that has the virus. So is there um, maybe, is that something that we should be considering as well? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And, and there is a price for everything. So while the app does protect privacy, um, it cannot do it absolutely because it is giving information about what has happened to one person to another person. So certainly in the case where there's a very small group of people, or you could even imagine that uh, what you're you're only in contact with one person 90% of the time and uh, you get notified, then you're likely to be able to get, guess, you know, who has, has infected you. Um, I think that's just a trade-off and uh, every situation is different. So that's why I, th I think it's important that the app installation remains voluntary, exactly as um, as you said before. And um, each person has to decide on their own. Uh, what measures did the app makers take to ensure us of our privacy now and in the future? Because there is, I know that maybe the coronavirus might not be stigmatized, but perhaps in a year it might be. Yes, yes. Um, so I think one of the most important measures is that the app maker state that the data is not stored long term anywhere. So uh, the incubation period for the virus is two weeks, and that's how long um, a history you can get about uh, who you've exposed and, and who, who might have been exposed that you've been in contact with. So I think that's a very important safeguard. I think the other safeguard is that the, um, the digital handshakes are done with pseudonyms. So um, it, is dif it is difficult, not impossible, as, as, you, as you pointed out, but difficult to tie it back to a particular person, especially if there are a lot of possibilities. And all you know that you is someone that you've come in contact with in the last two weeks has been infected. But you, you, it's impossible from the app to find out which one it is. Um, I'm thinking, too, like uh, September's around the corner. A lot of people are talking about back to school. There's going to be a ton of kids going back to school um, probably going to be closer in proximity than most people would be on a day-to-day -day basis. So would smartphones be, cons is this something that would maybe be uh, branched out to include schools and um, in communities where people are going to be in close proximity for the foreseeable future? Um, I haven't heard any plans about that. I, I, I would guess that they would. Um, we would still first want to see how effective the phone is, uh, the phone app is. Again, that's something that uh, we don't know. Um, it does. If it does prove to be effective, though, I, I would hope that um, people find ways to get usage to the people who are most vulnerable to to uh, this disease. Uh, one thing I was reading about the other day was that you don't have to give um, a full smartphone to use this. So, again, Singapore 
has deployed these devices um, uh, where it's just a simple device. It's not a full smartphone, but it does just what the app does. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a replacement for the app without the whole smartphone baggage. And, um, you know, I think in, in terms of kids, that that is also a nice decoupler. I, I have small kids and, um, you know, I don't I don't necessarily want them to have a full smartphone, but at the same time, I do want them to be safer. David Lee, thank you so much. I think you've answered a lot of questions for us. We really appreciate your time and your insight. Again, it's my pleasure, and thank you very much for having me. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.